For this video, I'm going to need your patience as well as your toughness. Because what I'll be discussing will require the normalization of many inhumane elements, such as killings, beheadings, burning of bodies, and rape. These are touchy subjects, I know, but unfortunately require a discussion in detail so that the many myths about what actually happened on October 7th in Israel and the narrative that followed suit can be revealed. Many things can evolve over a three-month period of time, especially truths and narratives. Even facts can apparently quickly shift from the realm of witnessed accuracy to unfounded fabrication. Please don't worry though, there will be no graphic content at any point, but the toughness I seek in you during this video is more about the handling of the alleged brutal behavior during the events of the day. Numbers, although they are neutral and empty of emotions, when dealing with the death of people and when the figures rise to hefty heights can drive massive emotional reaction such as sadness, fear, or anger. And on October 7th, 2023, as the resistance group Hamas invaded Israel and overcame the Israeli Defense Forces from across the Gaza Strip, a great number of Israeli and international civilians were killed by the militants in their subsequent infiltration. Great amounts of anger was triggered that day. Reaction to this event, based on historic precedent, suggested a massive Israeli retaliation that was going to be disproportionate. Everyone knew this especially the Israelis. And to prepare the world for what was to come, Israel needed as much political and emotional capital cached in its reserve. And that capital came in the form of the highest casualty count possible. And fortunately for Israel, the number was quite high, 1,400 killed. And at this point is where I share with you that for Israel, that was as high as capital as was ever going to be. The world in general, but the West more specifically, in that moment had exorbitant amounts of sympathy for the Israeli people and cause. None for neither Hamas nor the Palestinians. But the truth of the matter was that it was all going to be downhill from there. There always was going to be a direct link between the actions Israel would subsequently take towards the Palestinians militarily and for how long it would take for that capital and sympathetic sentiment to be consumed. So as it initiated its response, Israel had to be more creative in ways to keep replenishing this capital and keep global sentiment on its side in order for their intentions and actions to be sustained for as long as realistically possible. 1,400 killed, approximately. This number has not been fixed and has over the duration of the conflict either been in a downward decline or was challenged by the discovery of more facts regarding the nature and manner of killings on October 7th. And one disclaimer here is that you'll have to forgive the lack of exactness when it comes to the total number of Israeli deaths, as unfortunately, there's not one reliable source for a fixed figure when it comes to the day's casualties and its respective breakdown. Within the first 48 hours, the original reporting of the attacks reflected a vast majority of those killed by the militants as civilians, in excess of 1,000, with the rest coming from the military or police. On October 8th, conflicting reports started to emerge from within Israel. Was it 400 IDF and police members killed or 580? The Times of Israel identified each and every soldier or police officer by name and rank, listing them. That had to be a very accurate assessment and count based on actual corpses discovered and identified. This was the first conflict between fact and narrative, and very quickly, these names and numbers were never mentioned again by any Israeli or Western media. For Israel, the more the civilian victims, the better for global sympathy. On October 10th, Israel would reduce the total number of victims from 1,400 to 1,200 casualties after its forensic investigations and DNA testing of the deceased. Uh, we originally said in the atrocious uh, uh, Hamas attack on our people, on October 7th, we had the number at 1,400 casualties. And now we've revised that down to 1,200 because we understood that we had overestimated. We, we made a mistake. There were actually bodies that were so badly burnt, we thought they were ours. In the end, apparently, they were uh, Hamas terrorists. Two points come out of this admission by Israel. If 200 deaths from the initial casualty estimates were Hamas militants who were burnt beyond recognition, then wouldn't a follow-up question to that clarity be how many Israeli casualties were burnt beyond recognition? More to come on that point later on. The second point would be that if the casualty count was now 1,200 and 580 were security forces, 
then the civilian casualty percentage was now at 50%. Not a great outcome for the upkeep of global sentiment. On the 15th of December, five weeks after Israel's first revision, a further revision based on an Israeli social security audit of those who were deceased led to a decrease in the overall Israeli and international casualty count from 1200 to 1139. 695 Israeli citizens, as well as 373 security forces and 71 foreigners. At this point is where this number was stabilized, two months after the event. Please note again the inaccuracy of the figure that was reported at the outset for security forces by name and rank, 580, and the reduced number of 373 in mid-December. Why, if names and ranks were listed in full detail? A secondary and important subtext of the Israeli death toll factor was the nature in which these casualties were killed. Within the first instance of the attack on Israel by Hamas, major confusion reigned. The IDF was caught off guard and the individuals within the army took it upon themselves to act independently and accordingly. A Ynet article stated that there was an immense and complex quantity of friendly fire incidents during the 7th of October attack, that it would not be morally sound to investigate, given their number and the challenges soldiers were facing at the time. The point I'm making is that on October 7th, massive friendly fire caused a great number of Israeli, international civilian and security fatalities. And on October 30th, eyewitness accounts came to the surface telling of the many tales like in Be'eri Kibbutz, where in one instant, 13 civilians were struck dead when an Israeli tank targeted a home where hostages were held. So if 13 died in one kibbutz by the Israeli forces, how many others died in the other villages? I'm not suggesting by any means that Hamas had no hand in killing a substantial number of civilians. But what I am saying is that there are many more instances that reflect the use of substantial weaponry, much beyond Hamas's capabilities on the day that led to the killing of civilians. Just look at these other villages that show the same burnt out houses and buildings. How can we say that these houses were burnt by Hamas? Were they hauling fuel around with them to cause such fire damage? Impossible. The destruction and charring of homes and bodies was the result of systematic tank shelling. Please recall my point about the burned bodies that were many as per Israeli government officials. How many bodies overall were burned beyond recognition and due to tank fire? Then there is the Nova Music Festival. Here, no tank was present, but in its place, something much more devastating and effective, the US Apache attack helicopter. Countless reports reflect the chaos at the festival. Israeli pilots immediately encountered difficulty in determining which outposts and settlements were occupied and distinguishing between Palestinian militants, the soldiers, and the civilians on the ground. Helicopter crews initially sustained a high rate of fire, attacking approximately 300 targets in four hours. How can we again make such illogical statements that the wreckage of these cars, burned to bits at the festival, was the doing of Hamas? How? Only the impacts and effects of Hellfire missiles fired by the Apache helicopter could result in such damage. More bodies burned beyond recognition. One clarification that is critical and one that will debunk any claims that these destroyed and burnt out houses and bodies might have been due to the rockets fired by Hamas into Israel is how the facts reveal that none of these kibbutzim were targeted by Hamas on early October 7th. No explosions were reported there by anyone due to the landing of rockets. So between the tank, helicopter, and traditional gun-friendly fire, how many of their own countrymen did the IDF kill? It's hard to reflect what that number is. For the Israeli government, it was not morally the right time to investigate during the events of the retaliation. Whether there will eventually be a final audit of what took place is unknown at this moment. But what is fact for sure is that the number killed by the anger and fear-stricken IDF is substantial. One discovery of a self-inflicted massacre after the next meant that the total number of casualties caused by Hamas was in decline. Would this result in a less universal sentiment for the Israeli cause or reduce political capital for the eventual annihilation of the Ghazan people? It must have been very early on when the IDF discovered that more Israeli civilians had died at the hands of its own friendly fire. Hence, the immediate need for the claims of devastatingly inhumane conduct enacted by Hamas that had to publicly and aggressively be pushed out. And this leads us to our second factor of the Israeli strategy, dehumanizing Hamas. 
the reality on the ground was evident to the Israeli government. A lot of miscalculations and unforgivable human error had taken place by the IDF. And on October 10th, a mere three days after the Hamas attack, the first of a series of false claims was publicized through questionable reporting. 40 beheaded babies. The Western media and thereafter the Western leadership quickly consumed such a tragedy as fact and regurgitated it for the masses. Here we have Biden stating confidently that he personally has seen the evidence. I never really thought that I would see and have confirmed pictures of terrorists beheading children. I never thought I'd ever, anyway. Two weeks later, on October 29th, new yet unfounded accusations of Hamas burning babies in ovens or the carving out of babies from their pregnant mothers were released for Western media consumption. And finally, the last possible vilification of Hamas, the use of sexual abuse and rape during October 7th. What is the evidence of systemic rape? Several witness accounts are the only evidence. No videos, no imagery, no scientific testing, merely statements by those whose names haven't been revealed, nor those who have come forward, but those who have questionable and changing accounts. Why weren't there examinations of the corpses to reveal whether rape had actually taken place? Why? Well, based on Israeli government statements, victims of October 7th were immediately buried as per Jewish tradition. If that was so, then how did testing happen to decipher who was a Hamas militant and who was not that reduced the overall death toll from 1,400 to 1,200? Another conflicting set of facts by the Israelis. Again, what I want to clarify is that I am not saying there was no abuse by Hamas towards any civilians. That is part and part of resistance and violence. But to say that there was a strategic weaponization of rape and sexual abuse is a reach. Hamas militants, if anything, had intentions and mandates to either achieve a high death count or more likely a higher hostage number for their utilization in future negotiations. Our final factor is the casualty count of the Gazan population that was going to feel the wrath of Israel. The number of casualties for the Israelis were significant, not from a sympathetic or humane perspective by any means, but it was clear that certain thresholds of those killed had to be offset by some other Israeli claim to counter the downward trend of global sentiment. A week after October 7th, 2,000 Palestinians were killed. Just over a week later, 5,000. Another two weeks passed, 10,000. Three weeks after that, 15,000. Another three weeks, 20,000. And after three months, 25,000. With all this killing, there was also the state of the 2.2 million Gazan Palestinians to contend with and who were uprooted, injured, or maimed, and who are now struggling with basic survival needs. Now let's overlap all these dates of the various factors into a single weekly chart starting on October 7th. Let's map first the development of the first factor of Israeli and international deaths. That starts with 1,400 casualties, and a month later gets revised to 1,200, but eventually is reduced and fixed at 1139. But to get a more accurate final count of casualties reflective of what happened on the 7th, we have to overlay the potential decrease in casualties due to friendly fire. We start with the tank shelling in Be'eri Kibbutz, and then the reporting that other villages and kibbutzim were targeted by the IDF. Onward to the reports of the Nova Festival friendly fire, which in all likelihood resulted in the largest number of self-inflicted casualties. And if we take real data reflecting the ratios of those confirmed killed by friendly fire at Be'eri Kibbutz and Kafr Azza, as well as the substantial damage seen at the music festival, it would not be a long shot to say that over 250 people at least were potentially killed by friendly fire resulting in a casualty total inflicted by Hamas at lower than 900. Let's now superimpose the number of Gazan casualties over the same period of time. And finally, let's overlay the attempts by the Israeli government and IDF to influence public sympathy and support with their fake reporting. On October 10th, the first internal discoveries by the IDF of friendly fire worried the government. And as the kill count in Gaza was approaching 2,000, the IDF introduces the first reports of 40 beheaded babies into the news cycle. Three weeks later, this is debunked, as no proof was provided even though many reporters and politicians claimed otherwise. 
As the death toll in Gaza approached 5,000 and further discovery of friendly fire deaths at other kibbutzim came to service, the next series of lies were released by the security services. Babies in the oven. This news cycle didn't last long as no proof was provided. As the number of Israeli casualties were reduced even further and as the death count in Gaza hit 15,000, Israel resorted to the last of its tactics, the release of reports that rape and sexual violence was a strategic intention of Hamas and continued to use such an attempt at gaining more sympathy from the world, but again, these false claims fell on deaf ears. All detailed evidence of my statements can be cross-checked in many publications or videos. If you'd like to go deeper into the disproving of the many false Israeli statements, you can check out the various links to Haaretz, the Israeli publication, and the Electronic Intifada, and many others. Simply said, the capital of global sentiment has run out for Israel. There are no more crimes against humanity that it can blame against Hamas. No additional suffering by the Israelis that can be fabricated. Israel attempted to squeeze as much sympathy out of the testimonies of released hostages and their claims of psychological and physical abuse, but again, with no real tangible success. Time reveals the truth, and in Israel's case, how it conducted itself on October 7th will surely be revealed in its entirety, as will its complete openness to telling meticulous and strategically timed lies, no matter how revolting they might be, and further justifying its violence and suppression towards Palestinians. For Arabs, this conduct by Israel has been known for many decades. The surprise, though, is how, for the very first time, how such a conduct by the Israeli government and security forces has been turned on its own people. You'll never understand the damage you did to someone until the same damage is done to you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. It would be absolutely amazing if you joined the Kennedy Chronicles. Helping us grow through subscribing will definitely lead to major improvements on both a qualitative and quantitative front. We'd appreciate it greatly if you click the like button as well as the notification icon so you don't miss any of our upcoming releases. I'm very grateful for your time and your patience. Bye-bye.